Let's begin. <laughs> hey there, scary story fanatics. Welcome back to Cleaving Thought from Bone with your host, Sociopathic. You're just in time, summer's just about here. But don't break out the swimsuits just yet. There may be someone watching you. So, pack your first aid kits. It's time we head back to camp with a terrifying lakeside tale that Doughboy420 likes to call Locust Lake, Summer of Blood. The summer of 69 wasn't just a Brian Adams song to those that grew up near a little lake settled within the Appalachian Mountains of northern Pennsylvania. To many of them, it was known as the Summer of Blood, an obvious play on the phrase Summer of Love, which began two years prior when thousands of young members of the counterculture of the time flocked to San Francisco, California. However, the Summer of Love was an appropriately named Time of Love, whereas the Summer of Blood was equally appropriately named. It started with a man by the name of Vince Fuco, who had obtained some property in northern Pennsylvania, just across the border from New York. Vince was a bit of a party animal, and having grown up in California, and actually having been part of the Summer of Love, he decided that he wanted to do something similar. So Vince obtained the proper permissions and began to organize a music festival on his property. He planned to set up the stage at the bottom of the field that stretched up the side of the hill. Drink and food vendors could set up shop around the lake. He would even supply picnic tables for seating around the old apple orchard. The event would last an entire weekend, so there would have to be a place for people to park their cars and set up tents. Fortunately, there were some fields across the dirt roads to the entrance, so that took care of parking. Any overflow could brave bringing their vehicles into the park through a side entrance, and it was a forest. So, people could just set up camp anywhere they wanted, as long as they didn't destroy the land around them. They could have fires as long as they were in designated fire pits that he had dug himself and they had to pick up everything that they brought with them. And of course, Vince also had a few outhouses installed, because he planned to have a lot of people there, and a lot of people meant a lot of people eating and drinking, which means a lot of people needing to use the restroom. Vince thought of everything, and everything was coming together quite nicely. Unfortunately for him, though, Woodstock began on August 15th, 1969, and lasted until the 18th, beating Vince's self-named festival, Vinstock, to the punch by one week, causing it to be greatly overshadowed by the much more well-known Woodstock. It was Friday morning on August 22nd when the festival kicked off. People poured in by the dozens, and at the peak of attendance, there were only about 1,500 people that showed up, very much dwarfed by the 400,000-plus that attended Woodstock. Vince wasn't too upset about the turnout. He had brought over a 1,000 people to his land to celebrate life, love, and happiness. It was around 10 in the morning when a large, white van pulled into the parking area and a group of six poured out of it. The driver was a gruff man with a bit of a southern accent. He had a thick, black goatee and blue eyes. He wore a red flannel shirt and blue jeans, along with a tan cowboy hat atop his shaggy, black hair-covered head. He went by the name of Texas Mike, or 
Tex for short, on account of him being from Texas. He was a fun guy, an avid gun collector, and he had just moved into New York State, where his girlfriend Carly lived. Carly was an easygoing girl. She had blonde hair and green eyes. She would most often be found wearing baggy clothes, and she didn't much relate to the girls who wore tight clothes, or even to those that wore bell-bottoms or tie-dye. She was more of a lone wolf type, but she always had tags. Seth, Carly's younger brother, by two years, was also there. He was a fan of computer games. He even managed to get his hands on the very expensive PDP-8 mini computer, but he didn't pay full price for it. He knew a guy who knew a guy. He was a typical nerd. Glasses, dirty blonde hair parted at the side, and a mismatching hodgepodge of white dress shirt with a pocket protector full of pens and pencils and bell-bottom jeans that made him look desperate to fit in. Also, along for the ride, was Seth's best friend, Drew, who was a chubby ginger guy, a curly afro of red hair atop his head, freckles covering his cheeks, and also wearing glasses. He looked like he was trying way too hard to fit in at this place as well, with his tie-dye shirt and bell-bottom jeans, but beneath all of that, he was an even bigger nerd than Seth was. Then, there were their two love child hitchhikers that they had picked up a few dozen miles back. Vandal Moon, an obviously named hippie, he also looked the part. His long brown hair was filled with braids, his eyes were a bright, piercing blue, and they had a bit of a wild look to them. But that was mostly to the LSD he had both in his system and in the pocket of his shorts. His blue, button-up shirt was left open and he was barefoot giving him an even further wild look. His wife was also barefoot. She wore a long tie-dye dress along with a pink bikini top. She too had braids in her hair that were held back behind a white bandana. Her eyes matched her husband's with a piercing blue, but unlike her husband's wild-looking eyes, her eyes were more calm and welcoming. The bunch of them gathered their things and began their trek up the path to the concert and campground area, following the other groups of people that were there for a party as well. As they walked, they began talking about the groups that would be there. They hoped for some big-name bands, but they knew that there wouldn't really be anything like that. They would mostly find lesser-known bands or garage bands there, but that was alright. They knew the music would be good. My cousin's band is playing here! They heard a young man yell as they approached the gate, where they would have to pay for entry. The other man he was talking to replied to him, telling him that he couldn't let him in and that he had to be at least 18. It was an insurance thing. My cousin is Blaine Bruce! He's in bread for booze! Tell him his cousin Ray Bob is here! The young man said. I'm sorry, man. You're 15. Can't let you in. And what kind of name is that for a band? Bread for booze? Like they're a bread to drink booze? <laughs> the guard said with a chuckle. No, man. Bread. You know, dough, money, beer money. The band is beer money. Can't you let me in, man? The young Ray Bob spoke again. Nah, man. I'm sorry. The guard said again before the young man attempted to push past him, where he was immediately stopped by two other large security guards who hastily hauled him off the property, kicking and screaming. Glad they got that shop out of here, an African-American man said from beside them. He had an afro that matched Drew's, though it looked much better on him than it did on Drew, and he wore a blue vest, shirt with sleeves cut off, and a pair of tan jean pants. He also wore a long necklace of various colored beads around his neck. The guard made a comment, comparing young Ray Bob to a coconut before asking for the man's identification. Once taking a look, he called him by his name, Solomon, and told him to head right in. Solomon was followed by his girlfriend, Jail. She was slightly lighter toned, but she too was African descent. 
She had braided hair and small gemstones pierced into her ears. Her lips were a bright red with a colorful shade of lipstick. She wore a matching red mid-drift top and blue bell-bottom jeans. She had long fingernails that also matched the bright crimson of her lips and top. Tex, Carly, and crew followed those two in and Texas Mike decided to set up camp near to them because they reminded him of some of his friends back home in Arlington. The other neighbors were members of the band because the bands were also there camping out themselves and luck would have it that the band that they set up next to was bred for booze. The very same band mentioned by the screaming 15 year old at the entrance. Hey man, you're bred for booze, right? Asked Vandal Moon. Yeah? What of it? A young guy piped up. He was a bit sunburnt and had a slight cross-eyed look to him. He was completely clean-shaven aside from a little tuft of black hair beneath his lip. We heard this kid yelling about you at the gate, man. Like, it was a total buzzkill. But he said he was some Blake guy's cousin? Vandal answered. God damn it, the young guy said. What's going on? Asked a small, spindly guy with glasses who was setting up a few yards away. Nothing, Skeet. Just my stupid cousin Raybob, causing a ruckus at the gate. The guy said, revealing himself to be Blaine Bruce. Raybob getting into trouble again? <laughs> Typical. A larger man said after he climbed out of his tent, he had long, dirty blonde hair that was held back by a black bandana, and he was built like a bodybuilder. The guy was huge. Hey Neil, this is, uh, what'd you say your name was? Blaine said, introducing his friend to Vandal. I'm Vandal Moon, man. And this is my life partner, Rainbow Moon. He said, motioning for her to come to his side. Nice to meet you. Rainbow said calmly. Nice to meet you too, Neil said with a smile. He looked intimidating, but he was a gentle giant at heart. Hey there, I'm Mike, and this is Carly, and her little brother Seth and his friend Drew, Tex said. Nice to meet all of you, I'm Skeet, the guy with glasses said. Oh, and I'm Blaine. That kid you saw at the gate was my cousin Raybob, Blaine said. He's a bit wild, but he's a good kid. He added, it was then that a chubby guy walked out and agreed with him, and that his cousin was totally different, though. Yeah, yeah, Ronnie. Eat another cheeseburger. Blaine spoke up. The chubby guy introduced himself as Ronnie, the drummer, while offering a handshake. Weren't you just taking a leak? Neil asked Ronnie. Ronnie apologized, dropping his hand to his side and wiping it on his gray shorts. Ew. Carly whispered under her breath. Tell me about it, Blaine said quietly, giving her a nod. The next half an hour or so was spent setting up camp before everyone was finally able to rest and watch the people roll in by the hundreds. After that, the rest of the day was a blast. They got beer for cheap at the place, and pretty much anything and everything else they wanted in the party department was right at their fingertips. All they had to do was ask. The bands were pretty good, but they were all saving the best gigs, including Bread for Booze, for the second day. So that's when the grooves were really going to start. Nightfall quickly came and fires began to light up everywhere, both in and outside of the designated fire pits that Vince had dug. Security couldn't keep up, so eventually they just began to look for the more dangerous fires and put them out as soon as possible. Vince, however, was up on stage, playing with his Rolling Stones cover band, No Moss, a play on the phrase, A Rolling Stone Gathers No Moss. Nearly everyone that was there had gathered at the stage, where No Moss was playing the Stones' hit, Painted Black. The music was so loud and everyone was cheering, the sounds of their joy echoing across the mountain. Vandal and Rainbow Moon, however, had other ideas. Those two were more about peace and love, 
and the Rolling Stones weren't really that kind of music. They were more fans of The Birds, or the freshly released Cheap Thrills album by Big Brother and The Holding Company. So these two decided to head off and make some love of their own. Hey babe, check it out, Van Dal said, pointing around at something up the hill. Oh, Rainbow exclaimed. Blackberries, she added, before running up to the thorn-covered blackberry bushes. Mmm, she said as she stuck the wild blackberry into her mouth. Van Dal, joining her in the feast, provided to them both by Mother Earth. Oh, these are delicious, Van Dal said, picking another berry off the vine. It was then that their bliss turned to terror as a large figure emerged from the shadows behind them. Before either of them could react, the large, beastly man pushed Rainbow's head down deep into the blackberry thicket, causing her to become entangled in the thorns. She struggled at first, but this caused the thorns to dig deeply into her skin, so she remained frozen in place, hoping that her lover would help her. But he was in no shape to do anything. The large hands of the man then grabbed a hold of several thorn-covered vines, completely unfazed by the grassy hooks digging into his palms, and swiftly uprooted them before wrapping them tightly around Van Dal's neck, digging the thorns into him and causing him to both choke from lack of oxygen and from the blood that filled his throat from the foreign objects piercing his esophagus. He tried to scream, but only gurgled and gasped as the beastly man dragged him across the ground by his neck, leaving Rainbow behind to watch through the thorns that ensnared her. The man then tossed the other end of this batch of vines over a tree and strung up poor Vandal, lifting him up off the ground before tying the vines off back around themselves, leaving the man hanging there, choking to death with the thorns digging into his throat, before returning to poor Rainbow, whom at this point had torn herself up pretty bad in her attempts to flee. The beastly man then retrieved something from his side, an old, rust-covered axe, an axe that he then used to dismember the girl, slamming the dull blade into her joints until he completely severed them from her body, her scream swallowed up and drowned out by the sounds of people partying down the mountain. Vince had brought a bunch of people up on the stage, packing it nearly beyond its capacity, and everyone was having a blast, perhaps too much fun for some, and too little for others. When Texas Mike was thrashing around, having the time of his life, he accidentally tossed a beer can into the crowd, knocking a girl on the head and nearly knocking her out. Luckily, she shook it off, looked right at the stage, and screamed, Vinstock! cheering just like everyone else, not having a care in the world. After No Moss closed their set, the music was done for the night, and everyone had to head back to camp. But that doesn't mean that the party was over. Finstock was a lot like Vegas. What happened there stayed there, and the fun never stops. Well, for as long as the venue was open, that is. When they got back to their camps, it was dark, so Blaine and Neil got to work starting up a fire, which was actually in one of the designated pits. And while they were gathering wood and getting the fire going, everyone else sat around and chilled out, reflecting on the fun that they just had and enjoying the various different chemicals in their systems. It was then that a shadowy figure emerged from the darkness behind Carly, causing her to nearly scream in fright when a man walked into the circle of them and simply dropped something into Tex's lap. What was that? Seth asked him. It's a firework, Tex said, before lighting it and tossing it into the middle of the circle of them all, without even a blink. You probably shouldn't have done that, Seth managed to say, before the firework ignited and spun into the air with a spiral of beautiful colors before dropping back down onto the hood of a truck and exploding. Wasn't me, Mike yelled, looking away from the scene of the crime. Luckily, the vehicle wasn't damaged, and no one came to check on it either. 
It was then that a second, completely random stranger wandered out of the bushes and, in the darkness, walked directly into that very same truck. The young guy stumbled backwards, looking confused. Uh, did you guys build a building? He asked, completely in a daze. Yeah, Seth blurted out. They started with two sticks and a box, he said with a giggle. This was completely out of character for him, but even he was loosening up in this environment. The confused and obviously hallucinating man then shrugged it off and continued his trip down the rabbit hole. It wasn't too long after their visits from two random strangers that they got the fire started and were finally able to chill out. Mostly everyone gathered around the fire, but Neil decided to retire to his tent to spend some time with his lady friend, which was made evident by the sounds that soon followed. Everyone else sat around the fire, passing around a few joints to pass the time. <coughs> Where do you think Vandal and Rainbow are? <coughs> I bet they would like some of this, Solomon said, passing the joint to Jael. I don't know. They're probably out bumping uglies under the full moon, Tex said, before taking a huge rip off another joint. Yeah, probably. Carly agreed, taking the joint from Mike. I'm not feeling so good. I think the beer's getting to me, Drew said, holding his grumbling stomach. Uh, I'll be right back, he added, before power walking, cheeks clenched to the nearest outhouse that he could find. He opened the wood door and stepped inside. The place stunk to high heaven, and it had already been used beyond its limit. But Drew couldn't hold it in any longer, so he let loose onto the mound that was already formed. It was then that he heard a knocking on the door to his outhouse. It's taken. Find another one, he said. And then another knock this time louder than before. Hey, I don't think you want to come in here, man. Find another one, Drew said, this time a bit more sternly. Then a third series of knocks came, this time a heavy fist pounding upon the wooden door, causing it to nearly rattle off its hinges. All right, all right. What the hell, man? Drew said, before wiping, pulling up his pants, and opening the door. There you go, man. Have at it. Drew said angrily, stepping out of the outhouse, but was stopped by two large, bleeding hands. Two large hands that forced him backwards into the cramped outhouse. Drew screamed and protested, fighting as desperately as he could, but it was to no avail. His entire head was soon driven down onto the mound of excrement that had piled up out of the hole of the outhouse's toilet. His screams turned to gargled muffles, and two large hands held him there, completely upside down until he stopped struggling before dropping him into a crumpled mass within the outhouse. Back at camp, everyone was having a good time, and everyone was very heavily inebriated on beer and a various assortment of drugs. Ronnie was perhaps the most wasted of the bunch. He could barely stand, but that didn't stop him from downing another beer and stumbling away from the fire to take a piss. The next thing everyone knew they heard screaming from within Neil's tent. In a drunken state, Ronnie had opened up Neil's tent, thinking it was a toilet, and had proceeded to urinate all over Neil's pillow, his toothbrush, his girlfriend, and him. And the screams were of those of Neil's girlfriend and Neil screaming in rage as he emerged from his tent and pretty much threw Ronnie across Vinstock. In reality, he only tossed him a couple of yards, but he literally picked up Ronnie and tossed him like a sack of potatoes, to the joy and amazement of everyone around the campfire, whom all burst out into hysterical laughter. It was about half an hour that Drew had not returned after that, that Seth began to worry. Um, Drew's been gone for a pretty long time, Seth spoke. He's probably off tripping in the woods on that mescaline I gave him, Blaine said with a chuckle. What? Seth said in shock. You gave him what? He's barely even had any reefer and you gave him mescaline? Seth said, 
concerned for his friend's mental well-being. Relax. He'll probably just stumble out of the woods tomorrow morning and tell you what a great time he had. Chill, man. Blaine said, taking a sip off of a bottle of whiskey that he had brought along. This one time, when I took that stuff, woo, boy, there were rainbows shooting out of people's eyes, and it looked like everyone had an invisible person walking behind them. It was crazy shit, man. Solomon spoke up. Yeah, then you spent the next three hours in the tent curled up next to me because it was way too much for you. Jael added, making Seth none too reassured of his friend's safety. Drew never returned, and eventually everyone passed out, wherever they wanted to, which brought about a new day and a new party. Blaine was the first one up. He had woken up pretty early in the morning after hearing a commotion down the hill a little way from where they were camped. What in the hell are y'all doing here? What do you mean my boy can't come in? Blaine heard the shouting from down the road toward the entrance gate, so he approached to see what all the fuss was about. The security guard at the gate was telling the man that his son was 15 and that he just couldn't let him in. I give y'all permission to let my boy in here. That ought to be good enough. So, you should let him in. The man with the cane yelled. He was hunched over a bit and was a bit elderly, but he was not an extremely old man. He had a face full of gray stubble, and he wore an old green baseball cap with a bright yellow fishing license pinned to the side. The guard told him once again, no can do. Hey, Uncle Jethro. Blaine said, upon seeing who it was. What's happening? He asked. These stupid beatniks won't let Raymond in to see you guys play. The old man spoke up. Sorry, Uncle Jethro. There isn't much we can do here. I'll try and talk to Vinny and pull some strings, but I don't think we'll have any luck getting Ray Bob in here. Blaine offered. Thanks. You do that, and I'll be back when I can. But for now, I'm going back down to the house to rest my feet. I'll talk to you later, Blaine. Jethro said, turning around without even saying a word to security and entering his old, white, rusted pickup truck. Blaine made his way back toward the camping area and then around by the lake. There were very few people up and around this early in the morning. Most of them were so high that they didn't even know that they were awake in the first place. The young man then found his way down the hill and toward the stage where the first band of the day was setting up. Behind the stage was the only actual structure on the entire property. A wooden cabin that acted as a base of operations and the main source of power for the festival. Hey Vinny, you here man? Blaine said as he entered the building, but got no reply. The young man looked around a bit and was about to leave when he noticed a fairly large pile of a white, powdery substance laying upon the table. Blaine looked around and it appeared as though no one was in the building, so he figured that the owner of said pile wouldn't miss some if he so tiptoed over to the pile of white powder and gave it a taste. He licked his finger and dabbed it into the powder before returning his finger to his mouth. His tongue and lips went numb, and it was quickly made evident that this pile was cocaine. Mmm. Breakfast. Blaine said, as he pulled a bill from his pocket and began to roll it up into a straw. It was when he placed the straw into the pile and began to sniff that he was pushed from behind. A large hand held the struggling head of the young man face down into the pile. Blaine screamed, causing puffs of powder to blow out from around his face. Soon, the white pile began to soak with red liquid, and Blaine stopped moving, his nose and lungs bleeding from the invasive substance forced into him. The pile slowly becoming more and more crimson with the sanguine liquid draining out of Blaine's body. It was at least another hour before the rest of the people at camp started waking up, and it was another hour or so before Blaine's bandmates started to worry. Shit, you got kicked out? Skeet asked. Mm, 
That would be like him. Maybe he's off with some girl. Neil added. He fucking left us. What are we gonna do now? Ronnie asked. I don't know, we could ask Jeff from Starship. Skeet said. They left after their gig last night. Ronnie said, disappointedly. Crap, um, you think Mitch from No Moss would help us out? Skeet asked Neil. I don't know. Neil said. Come on, man. You're friends with Vinny, right? Could you ask him if he could help us out? Ronnie asked. We hung out a few times. I don't exactly think that qualifies us as friends, but I'll give it a shot. Neil answered before heading off to find Vince. Luckily for Neil, he found Vince just at the end of the lake near to the apple orchard beside the field. Hey, Vinny. How you doing, man? Neil asked. Oh, hey, Neil. I'm all right. Yourself? It's been a while, hasn't it? Vince said, happy to see Neil. Yeah, it's been a few months. And sorry to say, I'm not doing that great right now. Neil answered. What's going on, man? Vince said, concerned for his friend. Well, uh, Blaine, our bassist, He's taken off somewhere and left us, and we go on in like two hours. I was wondering if Mitch would be up for helping us out. Neil told him. Yeah, I don't see why not. He knows most of your stuff anyway, I'm pretty sure. I bet he'd be up to it. I'll send him over, alright? Vinny answered happily. Oh, thank you, man. You are a lifesaver. Neil replied before shaking Vinny's hand and heading back to the camp to give everyone the good news. Back at camp, Seth had grown extremely concerned about his friend. Drew still hasn't come back, Seth said, sounding kind of scared. Why don't we go look for him, all right? Carly said, noticing the fear of her little brother's voice. He was a total nerd, and at times she was completely embarrassed by him, but he was still her little brother. Seth nodded, and the two of them went off to look for his friend. Texas Mike stayed behind to chat with Solomon and Jail before deciding to go for a walk around the festival. There were people everywhere, dressed in all kinds of crazy colors, and doing all kinds of crazy things. There was even this one guy that needed some money, so he decided to let people pay him a few bucks to kick him in the nuts. Tax couldn't pass up that offer. After taking part in the festivities and drinking some beers, Texas Mike had to take a leak, badly. So he wandered off into the woods to relieve himself when he heard a commotion coming from the entrance gate. He finished up and zipped before he could see what was going on. Jethro had once again returned, harassing the security guard, but when Mike approached further to see if he could offer assistance, he suddenly stopped, dead in his tracks. Mike stood there in terror as he watched a large, beastly man lumber out of the forest behind Jethro. The behemoth of the man wore an oversized tan coat over top of all black from neck to toe, but it was his face that disturbed Tex. The man's face was a disfigured mass of tumors, cuts and bruises, with patches of long, thinning hair all strewn about his crown, and one of the man's nostrils was connected to his mouth with a deep hair lip. Jethro turned to see the beast behind him to say, Damn, you're one ugly motherfucker, ain't you? Before once again turning back to yell at the security guard at the gate. Oh shit, Tex whispered to himself as the monstrous man snatched the wooden cane out from the old man's grasp, and the man would have fallen to the ground without the aid of it, had it not been driven into the base of the old man's skull, before being pushed further into the face of the large security guard, pinning them both together against the back of the booth the security guard stood in, and killing them both instantaneously. It was then that the lumbering man saw Mike and began advancing toward him quickly, Mike didn't want to find out what was going on. He pulled out the pistol that he had brought with him and fired two shots directly into the chest of the running man. But this had absolutely no effect on the demon. 
the monstrous hands of the killer wrapped around Mike's, dwarfing his and turning his own gun on him, simultaneously breaking his finger in the trigger guard and firing off the remaining four shots loaded into the gun directly into Tex's own chest. A look of shock covered Mike's face as he coughed up a bit of blood and fell to the ground, grasping his chest, the gun still hanging off of his broken finger. The sound of gunfire being covered up by the sounds of music and random fireworks that had permeated the entire mountain. Back down at the stage, Bread for Booze was preparing to begin their set. The three remaining members completely terrified that they would be without a bass player when suddenly their prayers were answered. Don't shit your pants, Ronnie, I'm here, Mitch said, rounding the corner with his blue bass guitar. Thank you so much, Mitch. It means the world, man. Neil said, pulling his guitar strap over his head. Told you it'd be all right, Vince said, looking up from the ground at the base of the stage. Vince! Vince! A man yelled, running toward them from the lake. What's going on, man? Vince asked the perturbed man. Some big guy just made off with some of my stuff. He just up and stole a whole pile of fabric, clothing, and hemp rope that I had for sale. The man said in a panic, Don't worry, man. I'll have security get right on it, and we'll get your stuff back. Just go head back to your booth, and we'll take care of everything for you. Vinny calmed the man. The man returned to his table. Vinny went to take care of business, and bread for booze continued to prepare for their set. Carly and Seth had moved away from the crowd and had begun to travel up the mountain. They called out for Drew, but got no reply. They followed an old path up the mountain and into the woods, where they happened to stumble across a tiny, old cabin in the woods. It was crudely made with logs laid crisscross over each other at the corners, and the roof of the little cabin consisted of sheets of plywood and an old, torn-up blue tarp. Hey, check it out, Carly said, pointing to the cabin. How long do you think that's been here? Seth asked. Looks like it's been here a while. You think anyone lives there? Carly said, approaching the door. Wait, don't go in there. It's probably haunted or something, Seth said, grabbing his sister's arm, which got a reply of a simple look. A look that said, really? Carly thought her brother was being ridiculous and decided to peek inside. Within the cabin... She saw several cardboard boxes filled with various things. There were some wooden crates overturned next to a large tree stump that appeared to have been being used as a table. And upon this table sat a single burning candle with some torn black material on it, along with some tan-colored rope and what looked like a large suture hook. What the hell? Carly said in confusion. Then, suddenly her brother's small frame was grabbed from behind, pulling him away from her and lifting him high into the air. He screamed in terror, and Carly turned to find a behemoth of a man standing there, holding her terrified brother by the throat. He was clad in black, all aside from a dirty tan coat. His head was covered by a black sack that had been crudely stitched together, an X over one eye, and a mouth of jagged stitchwork made into a twisted smile. She too screamed with absolute terror as the monstrous man drove a single fist into her brother's face, smashing his glasses into his eyes and popping one of them clean out of his crushed socket. The boy's face looked as though it had been in an automobile accident, but it was entirely from one powerful blow of a fist. The man then dropped her brother's lifeless body in a heap on the ground before turning his attention toward her. She knew that her brother was beyond saving, and her only hope was to run. So, that's what she did. She ran as fast as she could back down the mountain, toward the hustle and bustle of the festival, screaming the entire way, praying desperately that someone, anyone, would hear her screams and come to her aid. Two people did happen to hear her screams, and they happened to be the two people that were camped out near to her. Solomon and Jael were walking up the path, having a good old time enjoying nature and a joint, when Carly came running and screaming down the trail. What's going on? Are you alright? Jael asked. 
Carly replied with a bunch of terrified ramblings that neither of them could understand. Wait, wait. Hold on. Relax, girl. Calm down and tell us what happened, Solomon said, attempting to calm her. He... he... he killed my brother. He killed Seth, she said, nearly in tears. Wait, who? Solomon asked, concerned. But before she could answer, the demon of Locust Lake answered for her as a rusty farming sickle came spinning past the trio of them before sticking deep into an oak tree. Him? Carly said before screaming and taking off down the mountain again. Solomon and Jael decided that she had the right idea and they too ran as fast as they could following behind her. The man trotted heavily behind them, covering two or three times the distance of a normal man in a single stride. They ran off the trail and through the woods down the mountain, completely missing the field where everyone was partying at and having a blast and where bread and booze had begun playing. The behemoth of a man chased them the whole time before Carly finally split off from the trio and ran toward the cabin behind the stage, leaving Solomon and Jael backed into a corner beside the stage where all the band's equipment and some of the electrical equipment was set up. Their only option was to go up. The two of them began climbing the outside of the scaffolding to the immense cheers of the audience who witnessed them. They thought the two of them were there to have fun. Little did they know that they were in fear for their lives. They quickly made it to the top of the scaffolding where some of the stage lights were set up, and there they screamed and waved for help from the audience, but they only got more cheers. No one could hear them over the sound of Bread for Booze's music. Everything appeared to be all fun. That is, until the beast at the base of the scaffolding decided that enough was enough. He grabbed a hold of the one of the steel supports of the structure and began to twist it with his bare hands, twisting it and bending it until the metal finally snapped between his fingers. This was followed by the sound of screeching metal piercing through the sound of music as the scaffolding tower began to topple over. Jael and Solomon fell with it and dropped a good thirty or forty feet onto some electrical equipment, both crushing them and electrocuting them upon impact, leaving their bodies in a smoking, crumpled mess. The crowd erupted into screams as the scaffolding tower crushed the bassist, Mitch, beneath it as it fell across the stage, where the remaining three members of Bread for Booze were left utterly stunned by what had happened. The crowd ran, screaming for their vehicles to escape the carnage. People were trampled, leaving some injured, and a few others even died beneath the feet of their fellow man. Their shock soon turned to terror when the hooded beast climbed onto the stage. Hey, what the fuck, man? Neil said, trying to stop the man that was just about his own size, but the monstrous man had other ideas. The beast snatched Neil's guitar from his grasp, ripping it from the guitar strap around him and, in one quick motion, turned the guitar's head around to pierce it through Neil's upper torso. His eyes widened as the demon quickly lifted the large man off of his feet and up over his head with nothing more than the guitar's neck, before finally slamming him back down onto the stage on his head like a giant, fleshy sledgehammer. This was followed by Ronnie and Skeet attempting to turn tail and run, but both of them were quickly stopped. First, Ronnie was put to an end with his drumsticks being forced through his eye sockets, bursting his eyes like water balloons before forcing their way into his brain, and Skeet had the unfortunate death of being strangled slowly with the cord of his microphone, pulling the cord so tightly into his neck that it actually began to cut into his bruised flesh. Shit, Vince said in shock. I didn't think the stories were true he said, as Carly nearly passed him by. What? You knew about this? Carly stopped, managing to catch what Vince had said. Follow me, Vince said, running behind the stage and into the cabin, locking the door behind them. Together, the two of them entered the next room, before Vince could explain himself. Carly discovered Blaine's body in a blood-soaked pile of cocaine, causing her to let out a small scream. Shh, Vince said. Gotta be quiet, he continued. That's... that's Blaine, she said, pointing to the corpse, sitting at the table. Oh, shit, Vinny sighed, 
feeling a bit responsible for the guy's death. What? What did you mean about the stories? Carly asked. I don't know. The locals warned me not to do this, but I just wanted to show people a fun time. Vince answered. They told me about some guy that lived up here. Some deformed psycho named Casper. Cas Casper Stoical. I just thought it was some kind of local scary story that they told people to get rid of outsiders. I didn't know he was real, he added. It was then that the doorknob began to rattle, and then suddenly the door began to crack and splinter as the demon of Locust Lake, Casper Stoical, began to break down the cabin's wooden door, axe in hand. Oh, shit, shit, oh, uh, come on, Vince said, attempting to act quickly. He led Carly to a metal ladder attached to the inner wall of the cabin, a ladder that led up to a trap door on the roof, where some of the speakers for the show were set up. Come on, give me a hand, Vinny said, asking for Carly's help to cover the trap door with one of the large speakers. Suddenly, the speaker began to shake violently as Casper attempted to open the trap door beneath it. Then, all fell silent, and everything stopped. They were both quiet for a moment, before Carly spoke up. What are we going to do? I don't know, replied Vince quietly. The two of them then began to hear gravel shifting beneath heavy footsteps, and they looked down to find the monstrous Casper Stoical standing there, staring up at them, his head tilted slightly to the side. I, I don't think he can get up here, Vince said as the beasts stood there beneath them, simply looking up at them, watching them. Wait, what's that smell? Carly said, noticing the scent of something burning. Shit, it's the cabin, Vince said, as black smoke began to billow out of the cabin's windows before rising into the air around them. The two of them started coughing as the smoke filled their lungs. What are we gonna do? Carly said, being stuck, having to choose between burning to death or being dismembered by a psycho. We gotta get to my jeep, Vince yelled, pointing at the red vehicle parked in his own personal parking area, just a little ways away from the cabin. Casper followed their every step, walking back and forth, moving when they moved, never taking his eye off of them. Eventually, the two of them saw an opening, and they took it, jumping off the cabin's roof and rolling when they hit the ground. Carly made it safely, but Vinny rolled his ankle when he hit. Casper quickly rounded the corner to find the injured Vince, and right when the future looked grim for Vinny, Casper was stopped by a heavy thud against the back of his head, a thud that caused his newly fashioned mask to fall from his head and onto the ground. Casper turned to see his attacker, but instead saw the burning hot end of a 2 by 4 as it pushed its way into his face, burning through every layer of skin on its way. He screamed in pain, the sound of water gargling within his lungs mixed with his vocalization as the beastly Casper pulled the burning timber from his face and attempted to dig out the embers from his melting countenance, his eye on one side popping and oozing out onto his now exposed cheekbone, giving Carly and Vinny enough time to make it to the jeep. The two of them made it to their escape vehicle at around the same time that Casper was done putting his face out, a face that had melted down to the bone. Casper retrieved his mask and donned it over top of his hideous face before jogging toward the jeep, enraged by his injuries. Vinny quickly got to the vehicle and started it, but as he was pulling away, the large hand of Casper Stoical grabbed the young woman right out of her seat as they traveled past him. Vinny was going to stop and help, but he knew he had no chance. So he just kept going, leaving the girl to fend for herself. Casper held the woman by her throat as she gasped for air, and he decided to return the favor. A burn for a burn. So he tossed the girl through a broken window into the burning cabin. She screamed as her skin began to bubble, and she attempted to flee back out the window that she had been thrown through. But Casper was there waiting for her, and with one push, he shoved the woman by her face back into the burning building and watched as she burned alive. Vinny fled as fast as he could and never looked back. 
The town covered the entire incident up, blaming the deaths on drug overdoses, accidents, and temporary drug-induced insanity. Many of the victims' bodies were never found, leaving them to be cast off as runaways. This included the father of a 15-year-old boy. He was drunk, so he probably just ran off. It wasn't anything the boy wasn't used to. Young Raymond Robert Bruce was driven toward religion after the death of his cousin and disappearance of his dad. People got by and blamed the incident on everything they could to cover it up, and eventually it was forgotten by the quiet little town and the world that surrounded them. Vinny never forgot. He went into a bit of a depression and started to drink heavily. He tried to keep people away from the area, but eventually he came into some hard times and needed some money, at which point he decided, against his better judgment, to sell the land. He sold it to a nice young couple by the last name of Treagle. He wished them the best, but he knew full well that he was probably damning them to share the same fate that all those other people had suffered. But he really didn't care much anymore. The man fell into obscurity and then fell off the map entirely. One day, he just up and vanished, never to be seen again. Well, if you survived this summer, I guess you can count yourself lucky. But then again, evil will return for you when you least expect it. But since you've managed to keep breathing this long, I'm sure you can hobble your way back here again next weekend. And until then, my Lakeshore Flowers, make sure to like, share, subscribe, and turn on notifications so I can catch you all again next Saturday. <laughs>